we welcomed Otto Tabuns, who is a lecturer at RGSL, as well as a defense and security analyst. The main question discussed was the security and defense questions of Baltic region, as well as his extensive experience in simulations and lecturing, taking in mind he's still quite young. Hello, we are very, very pleased to host Otto Tabuns, who is a lecturer uh, at RGSL, but not only a, lec uh, a lecturer, you also study, as I understand. That's right. Uh, you know, um, uh, this time of the pandemic uh, has been very challenging for all of us. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, you also, in a time of crisis, have to find a way how to reinvent some things or how to get the opportunities um, in the spots where you probably think there are none. And I actually did have a plan to uh, continue uh, with my uh, PhD studies abroad, but uh, as due to the pandemic it was not possible, I thought, well, uh, if I have to stay here, um, at least uh, with regard to my studies, why not to use this time uh, uh, very efficiently and uh, where to get a better education than in here. I, I know it as a student, I know as a lecturer, and now I'm very happy to, to come back here to study public international law and human rights. Amazing. Um, how about... How about this whole year, you know, in pandemic? How has it been for you? Would you say it's been productive? Uh, you have gained new experiences and have new projects that you are involved in. Oh, uh, certainly. Uh, if we look uh, at least at the academic uh, process, uh, I have seen the both ends of the barrel. You see, I started uh, this academic year by teaching in person, and then I think it was in October, we switched uh, to uh, this distance learning. And then as a student, uh, I have uh, carried out with most of my program uh, from uh, the other side of my computer. Uh, and that certainly has been something that um, makes you more acute uh, uh, in understanding what skills you have to uh, better, um, know what needs to be complemented uh, in your own way of studying. And I think that is very helpful for me uh, and um, not only in my personal uh, a process of enlightenment, but also uh, in that process that we provide for the students because they also need advice, they also need assistance. And this is something that they have never seen before. Uh, this is also something that I have not seen before, you know, all these uh, restrictions, the travel restrictions. Of course, uh, I could be um, uh, very snarky and say, oh, let me tell you about the time when it was possible to travel to America because I had the chance to travel a lot there and then, you know, the borders uh, came down, so to say. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, th there are students from abroad who are here that, that are missing their home and then um, if there is an opportunity you try to organize these consultations when you can actually speak to them, not only uh, write it all in the email, so that it would be a more comfortable uh, process for all of us. So traveling to United States a lot, why? What did you do there? Well, um, it was uh, very interesting for me. Uh, the first time I went to the United States, uh, I was invited to the Association of Advancement of Baltic Studies Conference at Stanford University, and I had the great honor to uh, moderate a panel discussion on Baltic security. So uh, not bad for someone in their mid-20s to do. <laughs> And, uh, of course, uh, the um, matters and the uh, subjects that I uh, studied at uh, this school and also with all the experience that followed afterwards helped me very well uh, to carry out uh, that uh, task. And uh, afterwards, I had the chance to return to the United States, uh, both uh, with uh, guest lectures, uh, because they saw that I was good at that, what I was doing at the Stanford University, and um, uh, then uh, they um, asked me uh, to one or another lecture, and then uh, I had the opportunity to uh, cooperate in writing a book uh, called The Baltic Interoperability Report, uh, which dealt uh, with uh, different aspects of uh, cooperation between Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania in terms of military and non-military security. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, that, that is uh, something that I specialize in, and uh, uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, as you can see, I can speak uh, uh, extensively about that. Uh, but the main point here was that uh, we wrote this book and um, 
also with the help of the Baltic American Freedom Foundation and the Joint Baltic American National Committee, we had the chance to open the book at the United States Capitol. So uh, also, of course, it, it was not only uh, my effort that went into it, but of course, it was very nice that the first book that I'm associated with uh, is opened uh, at uh, Washington, D.C., right at the center of power. <laughs> yes, impressive. And um, uh, that was... Uh, uh, first of all, picked up by uh, people here back in RGSL, and that was probably one of the key reasons uh, why I was invited uh, to uh, work here as a, a, a guest lecturer, uh, teaching international security, uh, because they said, well, if you're able to uh, moderate these discussions, if you're able to open a book and uh, land an opening at the U.S. Capitol, you might be all right uh, to teach at this school. So, Good so enough. Good enough. and so I did. Well, a high standard in RGSL, yeah. but but I wanted to ask is. Uh, well, more generally, why security and defense even? You know, there, are, mm -hmm. there is, uh, you can study just diplomacy, you can study contemporary history, you can study uh, even, I don't know, like European, for example, Union, which is, you know, very, very I prominent would say in school. I even be a specialist in one specific, uh, specific article from UN Charter, I don't mm -hmm. know, prohibition of, uh, yeah. of, uh, of the use of force. So why security and defense? Uh, uh, it was a very interesting way how I uh, got to that because uh, when I was in school, I I did well in uh, most of the subjects and at times it was uh, quite difficult for me to decide what to mm -hmm. uh, do further. Um, uh, I actually uh, at times relied on the exam results. You know, I did very well in history, but I also did very well in physics. Um, even though math was not my favorite subject, the applied math in terms of physics uh, mm -hmm. was something very interesting and still is. Uh, but when the exams came, uh, I got uh, um, A in physics and A plus in history. So that's how Amazing. I decided to go uh, towards <laughs> social sciences. Uh, even though, you know, if I have to uh, re uh, retrain uh, at one point, then certainly I know to which faculty okay. I would uh, okay. go to. But it was possible uh, to um, achieve a way uh, in this direction. Uh, one um, aspect that helped me uh, was that, that I found very interesting to work uh, with people, to engage in different discussions. And one opportunity that my school, the of Speedo State Gymnasium uh, gave us uh, was the debate society and that was uh, where I participated and uh, there were always a lot of people who debated in Latvian but there weren't uh, enough people who would debate in English and my uh, English was decent enough then uh, so that I thought well I will give it a try and then that's how it started I participated then in all of these competitions there were the uh, local ones also the regional ones with Riga mm -hmm. and Ietseva uh, involved and at one point um, there was this um, a national tournament and the topic was uh, regarding NATO and uh, I achieved the best individual uh, performance at that um, uh, debate and uh, that opened a lot of other opportunities. Uh, I, uh, I met uh, a number of people from the Ministry of Defense, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, also people from the embassies. And uh, when there was the opportunity, you know, there were the shadow days. I went to the uh, American embassy and uh, uh, shadowed the ambassador there. Uh, later on in uh, university, uh, when there was the opportunity to do an internship, I applied for the Ministry of uh, Defense. Uh, you know, th this interest of mine started already in 2006 when we had the NATO summit in Riga. And uh, already uh, then there were some opportunities to, to go and follow and shadow someone and see and I thought oh that is very interesting and also what was particularly uh, um, complimentary for me was the fact that you could actually uh, take uh, a lot of these subjects and put them together because you would need not only history but also languages uh, if you deal with uh, the technical stuff uh, as it is referred to uh, you need some awareness of what physics is all about uh, um, and uh, some uh, mathematics uh, especially if you um, consider cyber security uh, it is not uh, always about um, um, these essays and arguments it is also about numbers uh, about different other aspects and of course uh, the more of that you know, the easier it is for you to uh, strike up a conversation with anyone and uh, represent your country as I had the chance at the best possible level. So can you 
perhaps share, if it even is allowed, I don't know, <laughs> uh, what has been some, some applied uh, mathematics, for example, that you have used for ex in your yeah. work? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, for example, um, I have worked in uh, defense planning, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that you do there uh, is that you have to uh, do calculations. So mm -hmm. uh, at the end, of course, you have a political decision, uh, but uh, to see uh, whether uh, one or another option should be selected, you also have to calculate it, mm -hmm. uh, or if someone else calculates it for you, you should be able then to look at it and uh, see whether that is plausible or not. Uh, so it is, uh, well, Kissinger is a very interesting to read, but of course, that is only the top yeah. of the iceberg. It is a lot of calculation because you deal with uh, taxpayers' money. Um, uh, you also deal with uh, different risks that are associated with human life. So, of course, it cannot just be uh, this uh, political generalization. Uh, it also has to be um, uh, this very qualified calculation and uh, we had a, a lot of uh, experts who did that uh, and uh, it, it was uh, much more than um, the, the press release you see at the end which is also very important but there is so, so much more uh, work put into it. Uh, that is also the case uh, afterwards when I worked uh, um, at the field of uh, crisis management uh, and uh, cyber security then, of course, you have to have uh, this uh, at least basic understanding of these things uh, beyond the EU law so that you would understand why, for example, um, the, the European Commission is going in one or another direction or why this regulation or directive wants to achieve this or that idea because it is based in this uh, perception, the threat perception and the security aspect, and they do not come out of just this thing, oh, I feel that something might get bad. So you have the calculations, the options, and then you... Uh, do uh, the math. Well, uh, if we have this risk, can we afford it? Uh, and what uh, should we do then? But uh, during, you know, you have gained these knowledge. Uh, were you fascinated about uh, some specific aspect that you didn't know before? Um, specifically related to defense and uh, threat? Um, uh, oh, yes, certainly. Uh, when I went to work in the field of defense, then uh, probably the best education I got, the best practical education was actually to work there because... Uh, uh, the academic education is something that is required to work uh, in this field. At the same time, most of the things, especially if you come from the civilian side, not the military side, you learn on the job, as to say. Uh, you speak with uh, the people from the military, and then, you know, you may have uh, these uh, strategic clouds in your mind, but then when you have to do it uh, uh, in a connection to the uh, uh, the um, operational level or the tactical level, mm. uh, then, of course, uh, you have to speak with them, you have to listen to them, and uh, that is something that you have to take into account, especially if you deal with people who have been in the military for 20 years, uh, people, for example, who have led our troops in uh, Kosovo, in uh, Bosnia, uh, in uh, peacekeeping missions, and then, of course, uh, that is something uh, that is very valuable not only for work, but also for um, uh, your personal growth, because that is something that probably um, and neither me uh, nor you will go through if we do not uh, uh, pursue a military career. And uh, th that, I think, was probably one of the val most valuable uh, aspects, especially uh, if I then have to speak with students and explain these different aspects of conflict and this human side. Because um, if we have a, a crisis or a conflict or a war, it, it is... Um, it is human beings who are in it, and it is their perceptions and their decisions and their plans for their lives, which affect it uh, at times more than any calculations or decisions at the political level, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why we are now, at least in our country as well, talking about uh, total defense and involvement of the society in providing defense, because uh, we might as well have the professional um, armed service, and uh, we have the people in the government, in the ministry, but of course, uh, if we want to keep up uh, our independence, our sovereignty uh, beyond uh, law books, then of course that uh, um, invites uh, a bigger um, involvement and also a bigger understanding of what these uh, different individual interests are and how it can uh, help our society together. Can you perhaps share more about uh, more challenges in the, yeah, in Latvia, but also in the Baltic region uh, regarding security defense, uh, perhaps some predictions also and, and, and something that already has been solved? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, so um, all in all, the situation is uh, good in terms mm -hmm. of security, uh, although uh, many challenges persist. And um, thanks to geography and history and uh, the governance, uh, both in uh, our countries and also in uh, those of our uh, dear neighbors, uh, there will be some challenges that we will have to work with uh, for um, a long time, um, in, in some cases probably for all of our lives. Um, I think that uh, some of the issues that there were in uh, long term uh, were resolved uh, since 2014 because uh, the events uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, were um, such as uh, served as an alarm clock uh, for uh, not only the governments but also the societies uh, so that uh, just the fact that we have joined NATO and the EU uh, it cannot serve just as a checkbox because mm -hmm. the situation changes mm -hmm. and the situation is no longer uh, the way how it was in 2004 or how it was in the early 90s. Uh, so the, uh, those are the things that we have to work, uh, for example, with the continuous development of armed forces and continuous investment uh, in the field of security. And uh, that is not only the matter of uh, the defense sector, that is also the sector of interior. Because in the, uh, in the crisis situation, uh, you may choose uh, any of the current uh, Netflix series that depicts a crisis situation. Well, one thing could be the external border and the external uh, security if we divide it. So uh, the other aspect is the internal one, the, the matters that uh, police deals with, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, civil disobedience. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, uh, there could be genuine uh, protests and uh, criticism with some restrictions that are put in place during the crisis time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is also great opportunity for uh, uh, people and countries uh, who do not <laughs> like us or mm -hmm. uh, do not share our goals, to put it uh, diplomatically, uh, to try to, uh, you know, make the situation worse uh, than it is. Uh, that would be the matters of uh, how many people are employed in the police, uh, what is the qualification of people who are in the judiciary. Uh, you know, uh, when uh, there was uh, the riots in uh, uh, Great Britain at one point, uh, Already the, the rights weren't over where, uh, when already the first people who participated in them illegally were already uh, in uh, on the bench of the justice and uh, the court already deliberated on this decision, uh, what to do with them. And um, I think that is also very important so that it would not be the case that when the crisis comes, then we have to think about it, because the, the main thing for crisis management is this preparation and the homework and uh, how able we are to deal with this. And hopefully uh, this situation with the pandemic will also serve as a lesson, because it has indeed uh, shown uh, the, uh, the facts that um, that not in all cases we are ready for it, and perhaps in some cases uh, also people in the government have not done their homework completely. Mm -hmm. But was there uh, actually, an, like in your opinion, was there actually a necessity uh, for Baltic states to recalculate calculate and look through their you know defense strategies uh, concerning you know the neighbors Russia, uh, as you know when when it all happened in 2014 uh, it was like as you said it was like an uh, alarm clock um, but was was there um, a threat for the Baltic states to feel threatened uh, to, re to do that uh, to recalculate mm. uh, I think that uh, there is uh, I would say that uh, the uh, potential uh, conflict or uh, interference uh, from uh, that side of our neighbors is uh, certainly a potential issue and probably uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, issues. Um, and one uh, problem here is that not only the way how the countries themselves calculate their national security strategies, but also the way how they cooperate uh, between themselves so that it is not the case that uh, with the same security issues, you would have three or eight different ways how to reach this top of the mountain and how to find this answer. Uh, for example, if we look uh, at the same organization of armed forces, uh, we have uh, 
practically three different ways how to do that uh, within the three Baltic states. In Latvia, we do have the professional service. In Estonia, they have the uh, mandatory service. And in uh, Lithuania, as I understand, they have something in between. So they have the elements of the professional one, and they have the mandatory one, but uh, so far I understand they have been able to uh, provide it uh, by a voluntary uh, participation. So it would be then uh, a, a question, well, in the cases of crisis, if we have to cooperate, how does that work together? For example, um, when perhaps in Latvia we do have armed forces ready 24-7, but perhaps the amount is uh, slightly less than it is in Estonia. At the same time, in Estonia, they might have a, a, a bigger conscription. At the same time, they are not there 24-7, and it would require the parliamentary decision uh, to, to make them uh, ready uh, for uh, a fight. And how do you operate that together, especially if NATO has uh, to respond as one, and if we also have to cooperate with this enhanced forward presence troops that are in here? Because if conflict starts, it won't be possible just to draw it according to national border lines. We'll have to work together, and if we march to three different tunes uh, or more, then it uh, it may be possible uh, because NATO is still the strongest alliance in the world. But at the same time, it would cost us more, uh, not only in terms of money, but perhaps also in terms of human lives. But I have a question. I remember, uh, I I don't know, like it was, I think, two years ago, there was uh, a question raised when uh, NATO's, um, uh, I think it was NATO's, or I, 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 I may be wrong, but helicopters mm -hmm. and uh, ships uh, mm -hmm. were around the Latvian border mm -hmm. controlling the situation mm -hmm. of the so-called red line, mm -hmm. the red cr cross border. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I felt that uh, from Russia's side, it felt like it was, it was like, um, it was like, a, how to say, not a threat, but they felt like it's, it basically, uh, us are, the Baltic states are, and NATO, like on mm. our side, are basically asking. Uh, like asking for trouble. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, that may be uh, the line that they are taking, and uh, that is certainly that they can try to uh, 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 propose. Uh, you know, um, any country that would uh, come into a potential conflict with NATO could tell that because uh, NATO is the strongest alliance in the world. It has 70% of uh, global armed spending and of the global armed forces. So uh, it could be any country that borders NATO that could say that. Um, at the same time, uh, if we look at these uh, force proportions uh, between, let's say, Russia and the three Baltic states, then, of course, uh, the situation is um, not so favorable. Um, also, uh, if we take into account um, um, also the allied forces that are here, uh, they are not uh, more than the uh, Russian army is on the other side. Um, and uh, on the one hand, it is indeed true that we have to be um, careful uh, not to go into the spiral of arms race. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is the case that uh, for us, uh, in our constitution, uh, we have these basic uh, principles such as independence and sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, that are important to us. And so if we are not uh, are always um, able to achieve it on our own. Uh, what our history teaches us when uh, what happened in 1940s, we understand that this collective security is the answer. And um, NATO has not uh, been um, aggressive uh, in the region, and NATO has not been the one that has tried to shift the borders in Europe after World War II. Um, if we see what is happening uh, with the Russian aggression in Ukraine uh, and what happened with the Russian aggression in Georgia, well, we see who tries to uh, approach it with a revisionist fashion, and uh, then we can conclude who then has to be the more careful one and who has to respond so that that would not repeat on our soil. How, how would you um, value it? Of course, it's a bit too early, but uh, evaluate at least the intention of Biden's administration uh, in tackling this problem, but also mm. generally some NATO challenges? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the uh, initial stage uh, for his administration uh, seems to be very uh, beneficial uh, mm. for this continuous development of the alliance. And uh, I think that we have heard a number of messages that would reassure us here uh, in the Baltic states, um, especially if we compare uh, the 
the administrations of uh, Trump and Biden. And then for uh, President Trump, uh, a bigger priority seemed to be uh, China. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas if we look at uh, President Biden, it is certainly Russia. And uh, there are some uh, aspects that are important for him historically, such as cooperation with Russia in terms mm -hmm. of limiting uh, the nuclear arms. Uh, at the same time, uh, he's a very strong uh, transatlanticist and he uh, will not uh, reconsider the role the NATO has, uh, both in terms of European security and also in terms of American power projection. Because for the United States to be a superpower, it has to have allies. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, uh, there are these mutually beneficial solutions. For the Baltic states, it is the security. And uh, for the United States, it is the global position that it has had since the end of World War II. I have heard, uh, well, not even heard, I think that we you taught me this, that uh, there, uh, generally there is uh, this concept that the security, the notion of security has broadened, uh, you know, throughout the last century. And uh, could you perhaps say something about that? Why is it so? Why do, don't we just look at security in terms of, uh, you know, weapons and tanks mm -hmm. and, and just having this hard power? Yeah. Well, uh, that is the way how uh, at least some decision makers uh, looked at uh, security um, in many of the uh, previous conflicts. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there have been uh, some changes that have not allowed them to do so, even if they wanted to. Yeah. Uh, one aspect certainly has been uh, this circulation of information, mm -hmm. uh, the ways how we get to know uh, about uh, one or other aspects of war, uh, and uh, especially since the 24-7 uh, news cycle, uh, and uh, that was, of course, a bit uh, um, a long time ago already, uh, but uh, currently the um, uh, aspect of social media and the ability for individuals to be the ones who are uh, sources and at times trusted sources of information rather than uh, those tools that are in the hands of the government, such as the public media um, and uh, the information that uh, may or may not be censored, which at times it is if we talk about conflicts. Uh, we look at the Middle East, uh, for example, when I was in um, uh, Israel, uh, uh, and uh, we also had the chance to visit the border with Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting to talk with some of the reporters that were um, uh, looking at these topics, and they told that, well, you know, th there are uh, some aspects uh, that uh, you cannot report because that is forbidden, especially if we talk uh, if we are talking about this uh, active ongoing conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it is much more difficult for the government uh, to do anything about it uh, if uh, all the people have uh, cameras or phones and uh, the ability to tell what is happening. Uh, which is why the, any government is much more sensitive about uh, the losses of human life and also um, any damages that are done to private uh, persons because there are also more tools under international law uh, to do something about it and uh, uh, if uh, uh, not to get uh, these uh, people back uh, to at least uh, uh, get compensation uh, or get damages uh, or uh, just to get this uh, uh, moral vindication uh, to show that, oh, you did these things wrong. Those are the violations of either national or international law. And that is also... Um, an important tool how to bring some of these uh, decision makers down in terms of politics. And uh, that is uh, also something that uh, many politicians are worried about because that is something that they, or not them, but something that their predecessors in those roles uh, at times did not have to consider if we talk about World War I or World War II. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question concerning um, United States and uh, Baltic states. Mm -hmm. uh, Two months ago, uh, a new president of the United States were, was elected, and uh, it's not a you know new, not the recent news anymore. Uh, but I, I I want to know, um, in your opinion, how uh, the change of the president will uh, have an impact on Baltic states? Uh, maybe strategies and mm -hmm. policies definitely mm -hmm. change, and 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I think that uh, we have to look 
uh, not only at the president himself, uh, but also the cabinet and also the people who work there. Yeah, it was uh, very interesting to see, uh, for example, for the Department of State, uh, one of the assistant secretaries, Miss um, um, uh, Molly Montgomery, uh, uh, who will be in charge of uh, these uh, matters pertaining to Europe. Uh, she actually used to work here at the U.S. Embassy in Riga. Oh, so uh, imagine that uh, people who are making decisions that are very important uh, for uh, the uh, political uh, aspects and our bilateral security cooperation. Those are people who have been here and have been here, for example, uh, instead of, uh, let's say, being in uh, Moscow or in um, uh, Belgrade or uh, some other countries that may be uh, in uh, uh, Europe, but at the same time would give uh, different perspectives. So I think that is uh, uh, very encouraging. And I think that would also um, make it uh, a better chance for us that when the decisions are taken, uh, it is uh, more likely than not that the information that has gone into preparing this decision is uh, closer to the actual state of affairs rather than just relying on this uh, general understanding of uh, the region. Because it is very interesting to see that um, in uh, in the case of Latvia, if we talk about our public administration, it is difficult to be a very narrow specialist because in many of the tasks, uh, due to the resources, also in the foreign service, you have to be a generalist. You have to deal with different mm -hmm. uh, aspects and different ideas. Whereas in the United States, where you have, uh, I think it is the biggest uh, foreign service in the world, uh, China is trying to get in a bigger one. I'm not sure whether that has happened yet. But they have a lot of people working there. And as far as I know from my colleagues there, uh, they have the best salaries if we talk about um, the foreign service. Uh, then, of course, they have uh, a better opportunity to uh, become better specialists and, let's say, to take care about the Central and Eastern and Northern Europe instead of, let's say, looking at all, all of the uh, continent. And so, from that, uh, from these observations, I would say that that is a good sign. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably uh, we will see um, the, uh, more positive developments, more understanding of our needs and uh, additional resources. Uh, probably the um, amount of the defense cooperation uh, will stay on at least the same level. If some cuts will have to be done, it won't go to this part of the American budget. And um, uh, probably we may also see more a proactive role from the American side, more proactive than it is already uh, in trying to achieve more cooperative solutions. Uh, that is something that we have also uh, covered in our research at the Baltic Security Foundation, where I work, uh, that uh, there would be opportunities for the Baltic state to, to achieve certain goals, but uh, at times it is inhibited by, by this uh, unwillingness uh, to work together. And perhaps we could see that um, Americans uh, would be willing to, to give more resources or uh, have NATO give more resources for this goal. But uh, to, to get these resources, the Baltic states will have to work together. So this conditional support, uh, which uh, would be then selected uh, for uh, by the Baltic states if they want uh, this, and probably they would want this. You know, uh, given your really thorough expertise in security and defense and knowing how many things can go wrong, is it easy to sleep at night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You know, probably uh, the more uh, the more you read about it and the more you know about it, then certainly the more subjects um, join the list of those that keep you up at night. Uh, on the one hand, it is not so bad. That is very important, uh, especially when you're doing uh, your thesis or a course paper. If you choose a topic that does not keep you up at night, and, uh, and not only because of the deadline that is approaching, then that is a very tough life, and that is something that uh, at least I do not want to do, and something that I do not recommend to my students. Um, at the same time, I'm very happy uh, that I have had this uh, practical experience mm -hmm in the field of security, and uh, that is something that uh, not uh, many uh, teachers of this subject have. And I have had the experience to work with the people, and uh, not only in uh, Riga, but also uh, in uh, Brussels, uh, and when I had the chance to represent my country, and uh, uh, at one point you had this moment when people were looking at me and asking, well, what is Riga? thinking about this and I, I was looking back and they're looking at me because I'm the one sent from Riga and I have to give the answer. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had such a, a great team there uh, that I would say that for what they can do with the resources that they have, they're doing a great job. And as you can see, 
we are independent, we are secure, we mm -hmm. don't have, let's say, even um, frozen conflicts yeah. on our borders that some of the other countries with different approaches have. And it is partially um, uh, this influence of the uh, global players that we cooperate with. But on the other hand, it was very, very hard work on the account of those people on the Riga side or the Tallinn side or the Vilnius side so that we were able to, to get in this, this train and did our homework so that we would be able to be uh, given this ticket to this train because it was not a free for all. It wasn't like that. Oh, just like come in, join the party. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that, that was great, and I'm, I'm glad to see that the work is continuing, uh, both in uh, terms of the development of the armed forces, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, logistics. Um, you can also see that, well, I'm not just saying that because I may have many friends in that sector. If you, for example, uh, read the reports of the State Audit Office, uh, which, is, uh, <clears throat> which has no friends, uh, it, is, uh, it has said that uh, for most part the defense sector is uh, doing um, a good job, and uh, I can um, just uh, second that. It is indeed the case. Uh, of course, there you always have the problem with resources. You always need more resources to, to get the things achieved faster. But all in all, it is uh, a good idea. Well, uh, one problem that uh, all countries have, all countries in NATO have, are the emergent threats. Because you can prepare for the threats that you know, but mm -hmm. the ones that appear um, that you haven't planned for, that's probably the biggest trouble. That has been the case with the cyber security, uh, which was also one of the reasons why in Latvia cyber uh, affairs are mostly under the Ministry of Defense. Uh, so when uh, this uh, uh, public service capacity to deal with that was created in 2013 and 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, it was decided to put it right under the Ministry of Defense, uh, understanding the potential uh, security issues, uh, especially that we have an increasing amount of electronic services, um, uh, that uh, all the aspects that we deal uh, with uh, the government, uh, the reports that we have to give in, the applications, uh, also now the matters of the um, health service mm -hmm. that it has to be provided um, uh, electronically, also data safety, uh, privacy, uh, all these matters, uh, banking sector, financial sector, and that is also something that is not only a national concern, uh, you know that uh, some of the biggest uh, players in the Latin bank sector are the Scandinavian banks, so we practically live in an integrated financial field. Mm -hmm. So if something uh, goes uh, askew in the Latvian side of the cybersecurity, it won't help the Scandinavians. And the same also goes for the energy network, especially as we go away from the uh, Belarus, Russia, and the Baltic uh, system to uh, the Baltics joining the, the Western uh, electricity network. And we already have these uh, connections and uh, more and more aspects are being dependent on uh, cybersecurity. So these emergent issues are the ones that are probably uh, the reasons for not uh, sleeping well either for uh, myself or for the people who work, uh, let's say, in the public service. You mentioned dependence. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that in a more glo ever more globalized world we can experience more security in general, or perhaps there, in, because of this mm -hmm. uh, globalization, uh, there would be more dependence perhaps on energy or some kind of uh, exports or imports from other countries? So how would you see that? Uh, I think that here you would have... Uh, uh, the two aspects to this because you would have both positive and negative implications mm -hmm. for uh, independence. Uh, one aspect certainly would be the positive one, uh, which uh, was the case for the Baltic states. Uh, so this increasing role of international organizations yeah. and this increasing role of uh, collective instruments how to achieve security so that we do not have to fight uh, against each other and at least that we have uh, this uh, security area, uh, not only uh, within our country but also in the wider region Region that also brings us uh, the economic opportunities and this ability to provide for ourselves because one thing is to, to be independent but uh, you also have to provide for uh, yourself and if you just uh, close your borders and live in a cave then well if, if you have um, a very nice cave with a lot of resources yeah. then it is very <laughs> good but uh, as we know uh, if we want to get the, the better deal if we uh, ha want to have um, our uh, interests served best we have to have competition 
competition and we have to have these abilities uh, to reach out, uh, which is one of the ways how the European economic integration has worked and also uh, what have been the security benefits associated with it, that mm. uh, it brings more benefits than problems. Uh, so we might as well keep it and not have wars between each other and not have conflicts. We should rather have these other forms where we can uh, resolve these disputes, mm -hmm. such as uh, courts or arbitration uh, or this law that we all agree to. Uh, of course, you would also have uh, these uh, negative aspects. Um, you know, we saw, for example, uh, before the uh, pandemic, uh, for at least five or more years, uh, that was uh, the negative aspect associated with migration, uh, because um, um, it is, of course, a, a problem when people are uh, feel to uh, be uh, forced to leave their country. Uh, should it be the reason of uh, conflicts or should it be the uh, reason of uh, economic uh, issues that uh, you cannot feed your family or you cannot feed your children and then you're forced to leave. And that is certainly uh, something that has uh, become a bigger issue, especially that there are now uh, probably bigger means to uh, migrate around. You would also have the organizations, both legal and illegal, that uh, provide for this. And also the means of transportation uh, provide this ability to make uh, that kind of migration that was not possible, for example, at the end of World War II. Just remember the situation in Latvia. Those who had boats uh, were able to uh, leave uh, the, the front lines uh, from Kursem and go to Sweden. Those who hadn't, uh, they had to uh, see what uh, the uh, destiny brought upon them. Uh, whereas if we look at the situation on, on the Mediterranean Sea, then of course the situation is uh, much more complex and much more advanced. And as a result, it is uh, both an issue for the European Union um, with the way how to deal with it and how to keep its cohesion. And of course, it is also the issue for the uh, countries uh, uh, from where these people live, because it would be the question when these conflicts end, what happens to these places, what happens to these economies, to these ecosystems? Um, it will be very difficult uh, to rebuild that. And hopefully we won't, up, uh, we won't end up with wastelands and uh, a lot of these problems, environmental and political, that serve as uh, sources for uh, prospective conflict. When it comes to security and defense questions, uh, there's always, you know, political aspects mm -hmm. into it. And uh, my question is, you know, both sides always have their truths. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, as much as I've been into public international mm -hmm. law, I have noticed that there are uh, many interpretations, legal interpretations, uh, many opinions, and so many gray areas actually, because states have to agree on what they, you know, what is being like controlled uh, in like a lot that controls their actions. So um, maybe how to how to find how you see how to find the consensus so that the one state. Maybe actually who, uh, for the Merji, seems the wrongdoer, uh, seems fine with uh, the whole situation and not holding the grudge for 50 years. Uh, well, I think that it is indeed a difficult question. Uh, if we look uh, even at some of the constitutional principles that we have and other countries have, I think that there would be some issues that it wouldn't be possible to resolve uh, because... Uh, even if we talk about Latvia and Latvian independence, uh, you would have countries that have different opinion of that. And uh, according to their constitutional principles, uh, it would not go into their picture of the way how at least uh, their um, elite or their government uh, views the world. Uh, so that is uh, possible. And uh, that you would always have in those uh, cases where that uh, some would uh, label them as uh, civil war situations or some label as this. Uh, fight for independent situations. Uh, we know that uh, it was the case for the Latvian history, uh, the way how we got our independence, and you had the Russian Empire and the German Empire and these different claims and the history. And um, it is uh, notable to see that uh, up until uh, World War II in this period, it wasn't possible to find this compromise. It wasn't possible to find this agreement, oh, that, well, we have uh, our uh, important principles, you have yours, and uh, but we, we can uh, proceed and live in uh, this uh, area or live in this region and uh, stay the same. Uh, 
It was able, or it seems to be able now, uh, at least in the European setting, but it, you know, the, the way how it went, uh, it took a war to go through, two wars to go through, and uh, this reasoning and understanding and a lot of work, uh, not only from the government, but also uh, from the people in the society, that uh, this is something that we have to avoid and this is something that we have to uh, work for. Um, I think in the case of uh, Europe, it has been possible. And uh, I think that the European model has been taken uh, as some kind of a roadmap for other regions. I think if we look at what is happening uh, in the Middle East right now is something that perhaps uh, they might not uh, say it aloud, but uh, perhaps the European model is something that they are trying to take as this basis of trying to mend not only, uh, let's say, a political differences that may be mended, but also uh, uh, differences that are uh, grounded in uh, religious conceptions and uh, this uh, matters of history that do not go, let's say, uh, just to World War One, but uh, um, to matters that go to uh, biblical terms and biblical history, and we see. This uh, the uh, new peace agreements between um, Israel and several uh, Arab countries, and these are based in economic cooperation. Similarly, as the European uh, integration mm -hmm. was based in the economic integration, bringing more benefits, uh, because uh, should it be uh, Israel or um, 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 let's say um, uh, other um, uh, countries in the region, it is very expensive to uh, be ready for uh, imminent conflict uh, at all times. Uh, it was the case for uh, also uh, Egypt, even if it was the biggest uh, Arab country at the time, it was difficult and expensive for them to be in constant uh, state of war or a constant semi-state of war. So they understood, well, that, well, there are at least something that we can agree uh, um, on, and this is something that we have to go on. Um, uh, probably this is also the way how um, uh, China is looking at their um, influence in the region, these economic tools and trying to make this um, uh, investment and trying to make this uh, network of uh, economic interdependencies, uh, you know, if probably uh, um, uh, you and other students would laugh if we, if you would consider that this a liberal um, international approach would be something considered by uh, the government of China instead of the realism approach. Mm -hmm. But uh, at times it may work, or at least on the surface it may work, uh, at least to, to get this field of the countries, which if, if not uh, uh, they become uh, allies of uh, China, they would certainly uh, be countries that would not go in a conflict against it. So. Um, and probably it it is this understanding also for the government of China that it is much more or less expensive to do that in that way rather than to, let's say, uh, make a, a hot conflict, a conventional conflict, uh, to try to achieve the same result. Um, I, I I was wondering about NATO. I I imagine uh, imagine them as you know the good Sumerian uh, who's bringing the peace and uh, security to the North Atlantic mm -hmm. region. Um, but there have been discussions uh, in the past, um, not that long of a past, uh, about Libya uh, mm -hmm. and the intervention. Um, and there has been you know controversial aspects uh, in it as uh, one of them I remember about that NATO and uh, the states uh, intervening within a, another state they have to remain neutral they have to go with uh, an agenda for example as in their case to protect civilians mm -hmm. uh, but and and not support any of the sides mm -hmm. not a, like rebel groups or the government but in this situation uh, it was uh, different because NATO supported rebel groups and then again there was this uh, conclusion by some of people that then again you are um, using uh, using force for a prohibited uh, action mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering um, about the image of um, of a state and an, and an image of a non-governmental organization or regional organization um, to what extent their image justifies their actions for example if Russia d would do that that would be totally different in a reaction 
Yeah, uh, I think that the uh, matter of the image of NATO is an ongoing uh, discussion uh, which started already in 91 when uh, there was this question that now that the Soviet Union uh, is gone, like, who are, who are we, we now? Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> like, what, what is our purpose? And, well, as, as we can see with the um, uh, recent uh, actions uh, from uh, the side of the Russian Federation, it has become more clear how relevant that part of the NATO mission is. Um, on the other hand, we uh, also cannot forget that it is uh, an organization uh, that is an intergovernmental organization, and it depends on these uh, perceptions and interests of the national states. Uh, for example, uh, for the Baltic states, it is important uh, most important what happens um, at the eastern strategic direction. So at our border, uh, whereas, of course, if we would look at uh, Spain and France and Italy, uh, then uh, for them, uh, the more imminent issue is what's happening um, at the uh, northern African side, um, uh, also for uh, France. Africa as a whole has been a, a very uh, particularly uh, important subject. Uh, so. Uh, it is uh, then the matter of how these uh, national interests get uh, mm, uh, replicated uh, in the uh, NATO policy and how uh, effective are countries in representing their own national interests in the general uh, agenda. Um, I think that uh, it is difficult for NATO in situations like this. It was also the problem uh, when uh, you had uh, the um, conflict in Yugoslavia and the bombing of uh, Belgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was then the, the problem uh, as NATO at times uh, gets to uh, be judged uh, against higher standards than some other uh, countries um, around the world because um, we see that uh, for NATO it is not only the security aspect which is important, just hard security, but also the matter of um, uh, human rights and democracy. And on the one hand, uh, it is an important goal. On the other hand, uh, it is then easier to criticize NATO on these grounds because that is something that is important to NATO, whereas for other countries you may criticize them also on human rights grounds. At the same time, they wouldn't care because that has never been a priority for them and um, they would have uh, enough of a means either via se the Security Council or via the um, Human Rights Council uh, to uh, make the criticism go away or not seem as important as it is. So I think this is this double burden that the NATO has and also a problem for uh, many uh, European countries. I guess it's always disputable because when it comes to dealing with uh, something as civil wars or use of force with the use of force, mm -hmm. it's always conflictual mm -hmm. because there will always be two sides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, th th that is right. And, you know, also uh, you have a lot of uh, international lawyers uh, in Europe, in America, dealing with this. And uh, they also have the ability to speak freely about that. So perhaps, uh, indeed, uh, you, you could True. question some activities that NATO has done um, and the NATO countries have done. At the same time, perhaps there are more opportunities to actually discuss it in a more critical fashion that you would have with some other global players. Uh, that may not always help the image, but perhaps for all of us in the long term, it is uh, better, uh, at least uh, in my understanding, it yeah, is. Yeah, because uh, as I understand, states can intervene themselves mm -hmm. as, you know, they choose sides, mm -hmm. whether they participate or not. And I think that it's, it's an aspect that sometimes got forgotten mm -hmm. because they, they, they can choose on, on, the, on themselves and bring them to the table and ask why. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I had a question about what is your understanding, uh, your prediction even, about the world, uh, political, economic realities, we know you know, you know the the usual suspects as China. You know the, <laughs> the rise of China and and what can can it bring? Perhaps you can also elaborate on that. But perhaps also other predictions about the you know next century. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, thinking of. Uh uh, the, the coming century, the, the one that we are living in, and uh, probably that will be the one that we will see, um, not likely beyond. Uh, mm. I, I think that uh, this uh, a very um, interesting relationship between the United States and China will dominate uh, the, the headlines of international relations uh, for a, a long time. Uh, 
um, for the Baltic states, of course, uh, the relationship of Russia will be of uh, major concern, and the future of Belarus uh, will also be the case. Uh, probably the, the next uh, year and the next couple of years uh, will be very uh, important for the Baltic states to see what is happening with Belarus, uh, because if the destabilization continues, uh, it could become a humanitarian uh, problem for us, um, and um, of course any further integration uh, between uh, Russia and Belarus would also have implications for our regional uh, security. Uh, but if we uh, look um, in a, a wider perspective, then the presence of China is certainly uh, something that we have to follow. Um, um, more likely the economic aspects and the intelligence aspects, uh, as the, they are, of course, not a player uh, in terms of hard security. At the same time, if we talk about uh, the aspects of cybersecurity, financial security, and the matters of investment as a potential tool of political influence, that is something that that uh, Russia uh, uh, would probably uh, not uh, be in the uh, range of providing uh, that China is, because China is amassing more and more resources, and just the economy of scale of China is bigger. So uh, with all the influence that Russia can have with the money that they have, China has more. And so uh, if they will want to play this out uh, in our region, uh, then they would probably have uh, more opportunities to uh, do so. Uh, also, the relationship between Brussels and Beijing is something that is of a major concern. Uh, now we saw this uh, signing of the investment treaty that would allow uh, the European businesses to invest more in China, and we will see whether that will come with more dependence and uh, different tune when uh, speaking uh, about uh, the problems that the European sees uh, China has. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will certainly be something uh, that uh, I would see in the headlines and also something that I would recommend my students to, to, to work on. Mm -hmm. um, if we look um, at the aspects of uh, uh, the regional uh, development, it will be very interesting to see what the debate in the Scandinavian countries are with regard to their security future, mm -hmm. uh, whether there will be further discussion uh, about uh, Sweden and Finland and their relationship with NATO or their uh, security relationship um, with uh, the Baltic states. Uh, that is also something uh, that uh, we discuss um, in our uh, new book that we will uh, will be coming out, mm -hmm. uh, the Baltic Sea security, regional and sectoral perspectives, uh, because uh, there has already been an increase of uh, this uh, level of discussion in the society, for example, in Sweden. And um, it is also interesting to see that in the Swedish parliament, uh, in the coalition, uh, there are no political forces that would object, for example, to Swedish participation in the uh, transatlantic alliance. Because we know that in a case of conflict, uh, should it be, let's say, conflict involving Sweden and not involving the Baltic states, or conflict involving the Baltic states or not involving Sweden directly, um, the same goes for Finland, all of them will be involved because it is a shared uh, battle space if we talk about battles and it will be of utmost importance how do we cooperate if we cooperate because if we do not cooperate we fail and then um, there will be no way back. So hopefully uh, these cleavages will not be uh, played on uh, extensively uh, without us uh, caring about it um, and hopefully it will be possible uh, to deal uh, to deal with that and keep the European cohesion and also keep the transatlantic cohesion because uh, as much as it is a priority for us to keep it it is also a priority for opponents to break it apart so it is a, <laughs> a two-way traffic for us there is a one very interesting aspect of you which we haven't discussed yet this is that you have a podcast latvia weekly that's right <laughs> could you please say uh where did the idea come from and what do you do there yes so uh, this must be one of my uh favorite hobbies um, uh, other than reading uh feedback from students after the course <laughs> uh that uh, i do uh with uh, my friend from the united states yeah. uh, uh joseph horgan mm -hmm. uh and uh, it was very interesting that uh he came here as a fulbrighter and uh, when i was an intern at the the American Embassy, I was asked whether my high school is a good school, whether uh, uh, this guy coming from America should be uh, 
was sent there as an uh, English and history teacher. So I th said, well, my school was all right, so they uh, sent him there, and that's how I got acquainted with him. And um, uh, also, it was so inter interesting that uh, I also introduced him to one of uh, my friends uh, uh, that uh, became his uh, future wife at that point. Amazing. And now he is living in Latvia for a number of years, and they are raising two beautiful daughters in the city of Yalgala. Right. And uh, we always discussed uh, um, a number of aspects of uh, Latvian politics, Latvian history. Um, I explained a lot of uh, that to him. He had a lot of very interesting questions about about that, and he also qu had a, a project on um, the history of civil defense and different aspects of this part of the world, and we discussed uh, politics a lot, and uh, at one point uh, uh, Joe mentioned that, well, you know, there aren't uh, so many sources about the Latvian current news, Latvian politics and history in uh, English, and uh, we have these great conversations, uh, perhaps we could make a podcast out of it. And so we did, and we chose a very uh, timely a moment when to do it in October of 2018, which was uh, right the time uh, when the election of the parliament happened. So uh, since uh, that since that time, we have had an uh, episode almost every week, and we now have close to 150 episodes mm -hmm. that include both the regular ones where we discuss the um, main domestic uh, international news, uh, a week in history, and and, uh, some ideas what to do in future um, and I have to say that of course this uh, ideas for future are now much more difficult to uh, collect at this time but at least we spend a lot of time discussing Latvian politics which is always very interesting mm -hmm. um, and also we have uh, a number of interviews with uh, interesting people from Latvia uh, also uh, some expats but also some other people I also had the chance to interview the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, when we discussed uh, the aspects of uh, how Latvia got the international recognition and uh, many other interesting uh, people and now now we are still going strong now uh, in the third year and uh, I think that uh, in the terms of numbers we are also one of the most uh, listened to podcasts uh, from Latvia um, uh, and uh, amazing to see for example on uh, SoundCloud it is also possible to see from uh, where the listeners come from and you know there were like some like cities in rural America. There were listeners from Australia, uh, some in uh, Tokyo, Japan, um, uh, and uh, apparently some of them are uh, people from Latvia who are abroad. Uh, it was also interesting that we also had listeners in Brazil. Um, mm. uh, I know that uh, one of our uh, top listeners is uh, Mr. Uh, Andres Borim, who comes from a, a Latvian family who mm. emigrated to Brazil in the late 19th century. And you know they keep up with uh, things. Uh, what are happening in our country and this has been one of the ways how to do that and I'm so happy that we can serve that uh, not only for let's say uh, professionals and uh, people who follow Baltics as a job but also people who have some connection to Latvia and that is a, one of the best ways for them how to follow what currently happens in Latvia weekly. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I, I think that we can end up on this beautiful note mm. maybe if you have something to uh, add maybe something you would like to say to our mm. listeners or a question you would like to ask us some kind of a morale perhaps. yeah maybe <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, i think that uh, i would like to uh, uh, recommend our uh, listeners especially those ones uh, who would have English as their main language to follow Latvia Weekly also to follow what is happening at the Riga Graduate School of Law because uh, both in uh, terms of reporting there or um, respectively research uh, this is a great window into our country and I think that is a very good uh, uh, endeavor that we are doing uh, here, both um, as uh, students and uh, lecturers, uh, but also with all the activities that we do uh, outside of the school. Because I think that is uh, something that uh, follows us uh, from uh, high school. You know, the way how we learn to work there is something that uh, goes on uh, in our future lives. You know, as uh, Christopher, I remember you from the debate yeah. society as well. Yeah, uh, and so it was, uh, was, I was so happy to see that I remember 
remembered you as one of the best speakers when I had to judge the debate tournaments and then to come to see uh, you in my class. I was thinking, oh, that is very good. You know, the people who are very active, uh, they are still like keeping up with it. And uh, that is a benefit not only for them, that is also the benefit uh, for the rest of us. Um, and that is the same also with uh, this podcast, which is a wonderful initiative. And I think it also shows for your peers and also other people who are listening that, well, you can really achieve something if you uh, want it. Uh, it only it, uh, takes uh, this uh, willingness and uh, some skills in organization. Uh, for me, it was something of, of what I learned at the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law Student Association, and that helped me immensely uh, when we established the Baltic Security Foundation so that we were able to bring together Baltic experts uh, and uh, find resources, uh, not only to uh, promote ourselves and the expertise, but also to, um, to organize, uh, let's say, uh, these events for um, international students uh, who want to study uh, more and also that is something that we can teach other people who want to achieve something similar uh, because there are so many opportunities it is only the matter of uh, whether we want to take it because we can make uh, our lives as we want you know apart from death and taxes everything <laughs> else is possible and it only then depends on our willpower and uh, this school has been a great vehicle uh, to teach that that is indeed the case. Otto, thanks for the kind words. I think this was a very insightful and valuable yeah. episode for our listeners. I hope you are inspired uh, and I hope that... Uh, Arne, are you inspired? <laughs> yes, I would like to, before we end this episode, also a shout out to Arnis behind the camera Yay! who is supporting the, the technical, uh, the technical uh, side of this. So thank you for being in the podcast and this is it. Thank you. And as we say on Latvia Weekly, visu labu. Vista <laughs> lá,